Um, so thank you, ladies, very much for coming out this afternoon. I appreciate it. And Brandy, thank you very much for putting this together. I appreciate it. Um, so basically what we're going to be talking about today, as you can see, skin cancer. I saw the flyers out there talking about skin cancer. You know, who am I? I'm Jason Cheney. I've been in dermatology for uh, the better part of about 17 years now. Started my career in the United States Air Force, transitioned out of the military, and now you know I'm in the civilian sector, certainly. I've been down here for about 13 years. Love what I do in dermatology. You know, God delivered this onto my uh, doorstep, and I've loved it ever since then. Uh, I can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, so we're going to talk about skin cancer today. The didactic part is going to be kind of short. It's really going to be just kind of going into some of the skin cancers, uh, what we have as far as our recommendations for use of sunscreen and such. And then I'm going to show a lot of pictures because in dermatology it is extremely, extremely visual. So I really kind of want to show what does an abnormal mole look like, but what's a normal mole look like? Because uh, yeah, certainly you can recognize an abnormal mole maybe from a mile away. I mean, you take a classic melanoma that's black and nasty looking, certainly I would expect you to be able to diagnose that. But the trick is taking a mole that looks relatively normal and looking at the subtle changes and saying, okay, well maybe this is the mole that's gonna give me trouble down the road. Because uh, that's ideally what we're trying to uh, find is those moles that are going to give us trouble down the road, not wait till they're giving us trouble that prevent them. So hopefully, uh, we'll get some of that out of what I'm going to show you today again showing what normal looks like so that abnormal looks more abnormal. Three types of skin cancers certainly there's a few more than these but the three that we are most commonly associated with is basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma uh, and then we're going to talk about skin cancer prevention and like I said we're going to show some pictures. So anatomy, just basic anatomy here Unfortunately, my, I don't have a light on this, but if you go back to your certainly high school, college biology days, uh, we've got basically three levels of the skin. You've got your epidermis, your dermis, and then below that is your subcutaneous fat. Uh, and then as you get deeper down, that's where you get into the muscle bone and, and such. And we're, don't, I mean, cancer certainly penetrate into that, but that's really far progressed. So ideally what we're looking at is the anatomy of the epidermis and the dermis, because that's predominantly where we're gonna see most of our skin cancer show up. Uh, if you take a look at the epidermis and you look at the base of the epidermis, so you see this kind of dark purple that goes all the way up and around through here, predominantly up in that area right there. Uh, that is what we call the basal layer of the skin. And that's where basal cells live. Basal cells are the precursors to other skin. So to uh, squamous cells, your stratum corneum, stratum spinosum and such, you go up through the epidermis. Uh, it's basically the basal cell is the baby cell. That's where it gives birth to the squamous cells and such. So when we talk about basal cell carcinoma, that's where it originates from, that basal cell, that basement membrane zone of the epidermis that butts up to the dermis itself. And then as you get further up, that lighter purple, kind of that cross hatching that you see up there, that's gonna be where your squamous cell carcinoma is developed. There's, there's different levels of the stratum corneum that are inside that. Uh, but as that basal cell matures, it becomes a squamous cell, and then that squamous cell then can certainly become take on malignant potential. Now, squamous cell, I'll be honest with you, just describes this, what the cell's character looks like because there is some confusion when you hear about, a, and I'm sure in uh, oncology, squamous cell of the lung. That is a little bit different than the squamous cell of the skin, so there is no overlap there. So I will sometimes get people who will talk to me and say, uh, well, you know, I had a, a lung cancer and now you know, I'm worried it's on my skin because I had a squamous cell on my skin, so does that mean the lung cancer went from my lung to my skin? Or did that squamous cell I had on my arm now become my lung cancer? That's what I hear a lot more often. Two totally different types of squamous cells. The squamous just describes the the shape of the cell. There's cuboidal cells, or squamous cells, or stratified cells. Uh, so it's just the structure. This so the squamous cell in the lung is different than the squamous cell that you're going to see on the skin. So there's no overlap there. So if you do have somebody that would question about that, well, I've had squamous cells in my skin. Now you're telling me I have lung cancer. Is that what it's from? Is it from sunshine? No, it's not. It's from lifestyle choices, bad luck, whatever it is. You know. Um, now melanoma. Where does melanoma come into play here? Now, melanoma is a little tricky feature. Uh, melanoma actually is, resides in that basal, that basement membrane. 
it derives itself from melanocytes. And melanocytes are something that kind of migrate into uh, the skin from when you're, it, basically your cells are dividing, it, it migrates from the neuroendocrine system into the skin. And let's see if this will move forward. Okay, so let's go over this basal cell carcinoma. So we're going to, I'll talk about it a little more in depth. So originates basal layer with this epidermis. It is the most common skin cancer. This is one out of four skin cancers are diagnosed, really one out of four cancers, period, in the United States are a basal cell carcinoma. It is the most common skin cancer uh, that really probably one of the most common cancers, period, but definitely most common skin cancer. It's not life-threatening. Now, certainly you can get on the internet and I'm sure you can find a case or you can open a textbook or maybe you've experienced a case uh, where someone has unfortunately had a basal cell and they've died from it, they are exceedingly, exceedingly rare. So it does happen, but by and large, most cases of basal cell carcinoma are not life-threatening. Uh, this is from sun exposure and sun exposure alone. Uh, it's just from, uh, there is a rare genetic disorder that is associated with it. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about. So the basal cell carcinoma that we're going to run into is all from sun exposure. It's in sun exposed areas and it's just from tanning beds, from being outdoors in the sunshine, to sunburns and, and such. Uh, and that's the basal cell carcinoma. Then we go on to squamous cell. And like we showed at the anatomy, it's in the upper layer of the epidermis. It's not in that basement membrane. It's coming from the upper layer of the skin. Uh, this is the second most common type of skin cancer. This is the one that definitely has a higher metastatic potential. So this one does have, unfortunately, potential to, if left to its own devices, kill you. Now, again, it takes typically a, a long time, so people who have a squamous cell carcinoma don't have to freak out when they've been diagnosed with it. Uh, there is time to treat those now. If it's a long-standing squamous cell, I'm going to show you some pictures of some unfortunate cases where that was the situation, maybe not so much. But in, by and large, in most cases, if we catch a squamous cell carcinoma early enough, uh, the patients do very well. They do have a potential to travel. Metastases just means get into the bloodstream or the lymphatics and travel to other areas of the body. And that's where you get yourself in trouble. Um, when squamous cells have a tendency to do that. Uh, and certainly there's anatomic regions that are a little more concerning. Head and neck, hands, uh, lips, areas like that, that if you get a squamous cell carcinoma, there's a higher risk for metastases. Melanoma, so develops in the skin as well as other organs. This is the most, most lethal of skin cancers. Uh, one in 75 will develop this in a lifetime and that number is decreasing. Uh, I heard, but I haven't seen it in writings, so I was at a uh, meeting and someone was talking about that the number's probably gonna change to one in 67. Uh, individuals will develop a melanoma in a lifetime and incidence is on the rise. Now, is it inc incidence on the rise because we're getting more sun exposure, or the ozone is thinning, global warming, I don't know. My instinct on this is that it's probably a little bit more on the rise because people are more cognizant of it. They're more aware. You can't open a magazine, you know, whether it's Sports Illustrated, Ladies Home Journal, Weight Watchers, you pick a magazine, somebody out there is talking about, especially as you get you know, near the summertime, about what to look for for moles and use of sunscreen and everything. So I think people are just getting more aware of what to look for. They're looking for changing moles. People are getting in more often. Uh, because honestly, uh, melanoma is, most melanomas people do well with. They get a diagnosis with melanoma, get it diagnosed early, treated, and live a normal happy life. Melanoma is not what takes them out, it's some other process. Uh, and that is because melanoma, the, the long term is really determined by depth of invasion at the time of diagnosis. So if you catch them early, you do great. Now, melanoma, what makes this tricky when it says develops in skin as well as other organs. Basal cells and squamous cells are skin cells, that's it. They don't start somewhere else and migrate to the skin. Melanoma, like I said, develops from the neuroendocrine system, migrates to the skin, and resides as melanocytes reside in the skin. But unfortunately, melanocytes will also not only reside in the skin, they will travel 
to liver, lungs, inside the eyes. You'll see some bad cases where people get them inside the eyes. Spine, because it comes from the neuroendocrine system. And they'll never have a skin primary. So they'll get melanoma, die from melanoma because they got it somewhere else and they never determine where the primary was on the skin because there was probably never a primary on the skin. Uh, and that makes it a tough target when you're trying to develop therapies and such against something that could be hidden somewhere else. So it doesn't play by the rules, like a lot of cancers play by a rule book. Um, some of the rules we understand, some of them we don't, but we're getting better at understanding the way they are. Melanoma, we're, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, we really have no therapy that's very effective against melanoma at this point in time. Um, there's some exciting things coming out that people are living maybe an extra six months or a year, but we're not giving anybody any really extra length to their, significant extra time in their life. Um, now you will hear about people who for whatever reason get a metastatic melanoma and somehow their host immune system is really extremely effective against fighting against it, they get their therapy and then they do great. And we don't understand why is that person able to do that but others aren't and again that's, that's what we're trying to understand about melanoma, we just don't understand it. So melanoma, I kind of joke about that one, that's kind of the best way I look at that is kind of, you know, I live in Georgia, you can probably tell I don't sound like I'm from Georgia, it's because I'm originally from Pennsylvania, but I live here in Georgia, I call Georgia home, um, but originally I'm from Pennsylvania, and that's the way melanoma is. Melanoma's melanocytes uh, are not skin cells, they migrate and live in the skin, but they're not really skin cells. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, and if you guys have any questions along the way, I mean, certainly feel free to interject, don't because I can keep talking and talking. <laughs> so we good so far with understanding the different types of skin cells. Now those are, like I said, the three most common. There are other types of skin cancers. Uh, again, <coughs> exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Uh, it's not really worth it discussing because it'll just muddy the water uh, because it's just things you won't ever see. Uh, but there are some others that are out there, but these are the ones that we, we experience, unfortunately. So skin cancer prevention. So we talk about skin cancer. What is it? Well, how do we try and prevent it? Um, you know, the only way to prevent something is to stay away from it, right? So sun avoidance because sun does play a role. Now that's not always the case with melanoma. As you can tell, I mean, if you've got a melanoma internally, how would the sun? The sun doesn't touch you in there. So melanoma will show up in non-sun exposed areas. So that does make melanoma a little trickier too. But ultraviolet light we do know plays a significant role. Um, we've seen that in areas where lighter skinned individuals, like say Australia is a common place, melanoma is much higher rate. Arizona, much higher rate of melanoma um, and much you know, more intense sunshine. So we know sun does play a significant role, but it's not the only role with melanoma. Um, definitely we know it's a role with squamous cell and basal cell. So if you want to prevent skin cancer completely, I guess sun avoidance. Uh, but the problem with that is it's kind of tricky. Sun avoidance is not the greatest thing either because as you know in oncology what's one of the first tests that everybody does you check what blood test vitamin d level right mm -hmm. well what's really the only natural way of getting vitamin d sunshine. sunshine that's right so clearly strict sun avoidance although maybe the answer for helping to prevent some skin cancers strict sun avoidance isn't great because we know the lower your vitamin d levels are the higher your rates of cancers are, right? And the higher your vitamin D levels are, your lower your cancer rates are. Especially your bad cancers like colon cancers and uterine and cervical. So vitamin D is intimately tied to that and we don't really don't understand exactly how that is. Uh, it's probably not only just vitamin D, but we do know vitamin D is a marker for that. Vitamin D and whatever else is out there or inside of us that we have yet to discover. You know, there's something else in us and we're not, we haven't discovered what else it is. It's not just isolating vitamin D. So, how do I handle that? Because certainly I'm trying to handle a patient as a whole package. Um, you know, I try and recommend to my patients that, you know, I understand you're not going to stay out of the sun. Uh, you know, and I'm a realist with that as well. Uh, my kids play soccer. I like to go to the beach. I like to be outdoors. I like to hike. I like to fish. I mean, we're in Georgia. You know, we, we, this is an area where people like to be outside, and the reality is you're going to be. So how do you balance that? Well, you, the best thing to try and understand is that strict sun avoidance is not realistic. I mean, for some people it can be, for most people it's not going to be. So ideally, 
doing sun protection, wearing sunscreen, sunblocks, getting a little bit of sunshine. I encourage my patients, you know, three to four times a week, get maybe about 10 to 15 minutes of sunshine if you can. I explain to them that red is a bad color. So if you're out long enough that your skin starts to pink up a little bit, uh, if you're starting to get sunburned, you've been out there too long and you need to get in. Uh, brown is not a bad color. So people who get out, you wear sunscreen, you're outdoors, you're protecting your skin. If you're out long enough, this, the sunlight is going to penetrate the sunscreen and you will start to get a little bit of color to your skin. That is okay. All right, that, that's okay. And I, like I said, I encourage people to get in the sunshine because of what happens with vitamin D. And I'm really a strong, strong advocate of getting things naturally. I am not a supplement kind of guy. I will let you know that. I'm not a big fan of vitamins and, and supplements. And I mean, I know a lot of people say take extra vitamin D, but I, I think you, we should be getting our vitamins and minerals and supplements from the way God packaged them. Eating better, eating more fruits and vegetables, getting outdoors in the sunshine and getting a little bit of sun exposure, being active, doing those kind of things. I think that's the better way. That's the better healthy way. That's gonna really keep away cancers. Uh, skin cancers, although they are unfortunate, most of those are easy to detect so we can catch them. So if they're getting routine skin exams, if they would unfortunately abuse the sunshine, I can catch them pretty early. So uh, I don't get as worried about skin cancers. Uh, it's certainly, we want to try to avoid it. So let's talk about sunscreen and sunblock. What's the difference? Well, sunscreen, as you can figure, is a screen. A block is a block. It's like a screen window on your, on your house. You know, you open the window, the screen window's there, it keeps the bugs out, but it doesn't keep the wind out. Uh, it doesn't keep it from getting hot and cold, it just kind of screens some things from, you know, maybe some dust and molds and, and some bugs from getting into the house. So the same thing happens with sunscreen. It's screening out certain levels of ultraviolet light, but it's not preventing it totally from getting on the skin. Uh, sun block is just that. It's a physical block. It's blocking the sun from actually touching the skin at all. Uh, there are chemical blockers. Uh, which you can get some sunblock, some liquids and such you can put on. Uh, but I, I don't know how well they necessarily block block. The best block is to just wear a long sleeve shirt, wide brimmed hat, things that are umbrella, sitting under a tent. Those are really kind of the best blocks if you're looking for the, the purest definition of a sunblock. That's about the only way you're going to get true block. Uh, but they do sell, again, sunscreens that say sunblock. Uh, and they've got some chemical blocking, some zinc oxides in them that are kind of the vanishing cream so they don't have that um, for some of the old fuddy-duddies in the room, you know, the white nose. <laughs> exactly. I remember going to the beach when I was young and, you know, you got that white nose. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't, I don't even think that's around. I, have the I don't know the last time I've seen somebody with the white nose. Yeah, but they, they're vanishing creams now, right? I think so. And it stays pink and purple? Well, hers is white. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they still have some of those around then, clearly, yes. Um, so that's, those, are, those can be sunblocks because clearly that's not vanishing away. So that is right. probably a true block. Uh, so sunscreen. I, I hear a lot, you know, say, okay, you know, I'm using SPF of, of, of 100 or I'm using SPF of 90. Uh, what's the difference between SPF of 100 and SPF of, say, 30? Not a whole heck of a lot. So... When you're somewhere around an SPF of probably about 15, 30, you're getting probably close to about 97% protection against sunshine. When you go up to an SPF of 100, you're somewhere about 98, maybe 99% protection against the sunshine. You're talking only about one or 2% difference. But you're talking about a huge difference between the way that feels cosmetically on your skin. So it's an issue where I have patients say, listen, I love that SPF 100, but I don't wear it when I'm doing this or I don't use it when I'm doing that. So now they've made scenarios where they're not using it. So I would much rather have someone who says, you know what, I love my SPF that's a 15 or a 30, and I wear that every day, and I know they're getting sunscreen on, versus someone who's saying, you know what, I wear sunscreen, the 80, 90, 100, but I can't stand it when I'm at the ball field, or I can't stand it in this environment because it just drips in my face, so I'm not wearing it in those environments. So you're not, yes, you are getting a little extra benefit by wearing it, but you really, we get about the same by using the 1530. It's much more cosmetically elegant. So it is okay to use a 30, 45, something like that. You're not, you're not doing a disservice to your kids. Uh, Defects is not going to come to the house and say, <laughs> you're not using a 100 like you should be. Yeah. Wait, let me see your sunscreen. You're using a 15 or a 30. 
Uh, so I do want you to understand that using 1530 on a daily basis is my recommendation because I know you'll be inclined to use that versus trying to convince you to use 100 where I know you're not going to use it all the time because it feels gross on the skin. What about the spray versus the lotion? The spray is my personal favorite. I love the continuous sprays. That's what I, that's ultimately what I use. Neutrogena continuous spray, their beach defense. It's in a little yellow. That's, if you want to know what I use, that's what I use personally. I love it because you know, I keep my hair nice and short, so I spray it on my head and everything. So I, I kind of use it, and it's, it goes on like bug spray. It's so nice. It's not greasy. It's not grimy. You know, I, I, I might rub it in a little bit, but I really don't have to. Yeah, and it's waterproof, sweatproof. I mean, certainly if you're going to be in the water, you need to reapply, but if you're just going to the ball field or soccer field, something like that, I mean, certainly it works extremely well. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's great. And it's an, that's an SPF of 45. So that's what, I, that work, that's what works for me. So let's talk about that SPF. What, what does that mean, that sun protecting factor? What, what is that 15, what is that 30, what does that 45 mean? Because you know, that's the question, you know, 90, 100. What that's supposed to mean is if you take and whatever, let's use a generic, say you go out in the sunshine and it takes you one minute to sunburn. I know that's, okay, so we've got a candidate. You're out there for a minute. So if you wore, so a minute's just easy to kind of wrap your mind around. So if it, it took you a minute and you were already sunburning, if you use an SPF of 15, you could be out for 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Right. Or an SPF of 30, you could be out for? 30. Right. So that's ideally what that SPF stands for. If you wonder what that big bulky number is, you should be able to be out of there outside that many number of times longer. So 35 times longer than you normally would. So I guess if it was 10 minutes before you sunburn, if you put an SPF of 35, you should technically be able to be out there for 350 minutes before you sunburn. Now, again, that does not mean you aren't going to get sun on your skin. You will still get sun, you're still going to get some color to your skin, but you're going to do it in a much, much safer manner. You're still going to generate vitamin D. So it's, that's definitely my recommendation, wear some sunscreen. Again, brown is not a bad color, red is. Pink is a bad color. Pink is a precursor to red. So don't be out there long enough that you're getting pink or red. Tanning beds, you can read that just as well as I can read it to you. Uh, they're not unsafe, but they're not safe, if you understand what I'm saying. So sun and, su and tanning beds, are one is not safer than the other. It is ultraviolet light. And the same thing applies. You know, there are people who... Uh, not so much down here in the south, we don't really experience it a whole lot, but you get up further in the northern tier states where it's not sunny like it is down here and you get into the colder weather, uh, there are people who need to get into tanning beds to help kind of stimulate some mood because vitamin D is another one that is, is intricately associated with your mood as well. I mean, think about it. You're feeling bummed out, you go outside on a 75 degree sunny day, What's that do to your mood? That sun just touches your skin and you're just like, oh, man, I feel this is like a miracle. It's therapy, because it is. It's stimulating a little bit of vitamin D and vitamin D elevates as a mood elevator. Um, so there are people who get into tanning beds and again, I don't necessarily discourage them from doing that as long as it's used appropriately. I mean, it's just like anything in moderation. Um, you know, you could, you know, the recommendation, drink a glass of wine once a day and that helps your heart. Um, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but you know you turn that bottle of that glass of wine into a bottle of wine The wine is the same. Nothing's changed about the composition of the wine that wine that was in that glass that little four-ounce glass and that you know Bottle is the same wine. It's just the quantity that now has changed and now you're blowing out your liver and you know You're you know not getting up for work in the morning or whatever it is that you're doing so it's it's that's the problem It's the quantity Okay, not the quality so, uh, again, don't let anybody talk to you and say, oh, yeah, well, you can get in a tanning bed and that's going to be a safer alternative. There's only either it's a select ultraviolet light. It's not. That's untrue. SPF, that's what we talked about that. Okay, we good with all that so far? All right, so now we're going to get into just kind of understanding what uh, moles look like. The ABCD is a melanoma. Uh, this is what we use, kind of just a generic criteria. This is easy to apply. 
A equals asymmetry, B equals border, C equals color, and D equals diameter. And diameter, we're talking greater than six millimeters, which is about the approximate size of a pencil eraser, cap of a pen, something like that. So asymmetry, again, I'm gonna show you some pictures, so just I want you to kind of just pick up on this. Uh, symmetrical means if you take a mole and you split it in half, le right side matches left side, side A matches side B, they both look symmetrical if you cut it in half. So it's, it's symmetrical all the way around. Border is the border's nice and clean, it's nice round, clean all the way around. I guess, again, the border's nice and clear, not a, a chunk of the border missing or it's all ratty or anything. Color, uniform color, again, you look at it one side versus the other, it's a uniform color throughout the whole thing. And then diameter is just the size of it. If the mole is bigger than six millimeters, that's another warning sign. Now, there are a lot of moles that are greater than six millimeters. So this, each one of these by themselves isn't necessarily make it a melanoma. It's just criteria that we help to apply to it. And it helps those of you that are kind of in the field to kind of how, how would I pick out a mole? And these are the subtle things that you're looking for, asymmetrical, uh, rat eaten borders, you know, weird color, big moles, things of that nature that would lead you to believe that maybe this mole is doing something abnormal. So really any mole that changes needs to be evaluated. So let's apply that criteria here. So here's a young lady, got a few moles on her abdomen. And pretty much you're all the same. That's a belly button ring right there, so don't get perspective on that. <laughs> so let's just, let's pick that mole right there. So the first criteria is A, right? What do we think about that? It's pretty asymmetrical. A. You think it's asymmetrical or symmetrical? Or asymmetrical. Okay, all right. Thank you. So yes, looks symmetrical to me. Okay, so let's go to the B, border. What do we think about the border on that? Yeah, nice clean border. Yeah, I would agree. Color, looks uniform. Diameter, yeah, that's a larger mole. I would agree, that's probably about an eight millimeter mole. So, A doesn't meet the criteria for melanoma. B doesn't meet the criteria for melanoma. C doesn't meet the criteria for melanoma. So D, big mole. Do we think it's a melanoma? Nah. Especially if she says, oh, I've had that my whole life. Yeah. Now, if she comes in and says, okay, that just showed up last week, yeah. changes the scenario yeah. a little bit. But she's that's been there her whole life. And we're just we're just kind of doing a general exam. You see all of her moles look symmetrical, borders are clear, the colors uniform, that one big one in the center, all the rest of them look great. So we call these benign moles. Yeah. Okay? And that kind of sets the stage. So that's what we're looking at. That's normal. Okay. So now what do we think about that one? How about A? If I split that in half, does side A match side B? No. No. How about the border? Almost has like a diamond shape, right? That's weird. So it's like like it's almost like the borders have been hacked off somehow. Right. Because typically a mole should look like that, right? right. I mean, moles look round. I, most moles don't look like a, a, a diamond or a square. That's an unusual shape. So that would tell you that it's like somebody took a hatchet and hacked off chunks. Um, color? I, I would say the color is uniform, but look at all the other moles on her. Not the same as Yeah, it doesn't really match quite with everything else, right? And I, I, I do this joke again. Um, I think everybody in here will understand, the kids don't usually, but I always look at it, you know, kind of, I look at a mole, and then I look to see who's living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> because you're going to get somebody that's going to come in, and they're going to have 15 of those moles on them. They're just covered in atypical looking moles. And then you say, ah, okay, yeah, that's, your, all your moles look like this. That's a, okay, I can breathe a sigh of relief. This is probably not going to give them trouble. In this case, man, this looks like nothing. That just pops as soon as you right. see it. So, and then diameter, you know, that's the longest axis. That's probably about a centimeter. So this is firing pretty much on all cylinders, right? So is it a melanoma? It wasn't a melanoma. It was an atypical mole, but it needs to come off the skin, right? Because right? it's, it's worrisome, okay? <clears throat> what do you think about that one? Not symmetrical. 
Right, so there's a few things about it. This was a normal mold, but it was one that piqued my interest. It looked a little asymmetrical, a little darker than I like to see. Uh, the diameter was larger than I like to see. So it ended up being just a regular mold, but it still needed to come off the skin. More regular moles. Let me see some of these, more of the regular moles. Now this one, it's pretty symmetrical. Borders are clear. The color is what's a little darker on this one. Um, this actually is a benign lesion. It's called a seborrheic keratosis. Uh, you might say, well, if you knew it was a seborrheic keratosis, why did you remove it? Uh, a patient was complaining about some symptoms with it. Said it just was really itching me a lot. Yeah. So that symptoms, amazing. symptoms are a concern. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a symptom that's going on with it, you, you don't overlook that symptom. So I might clinically say at clinical it looks normal, but he's saying that it's darker and it's itching him. That needs to come off the skin. We can all diagnose that, right? Yeah. And you know, unfortunately, that's what we're trying to avoid. I don't, I don't want you to get to that point. I want you to, you know, at, at this point where, you know, it's starting to show as atypical versus, you know, anybody that's looked at the skin would say something's not right. Yeah. And you can see it's firing on every cylinder. I mean, it's, it's higher, elevated on this side, flat on that side, it's pale in there, borders gone. I mean, it's just, it, it, that's melanoma, and it was. It was a melanoma. Yeah. Another melanoma, yeah, it looks ugly. Yeah, yeah it looks ugly. Yeah. Real ugly. Yeah. 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 So good, so you can kind of see what we're talking about. I mean, this is just, um, Yep. So those are what the bad ones look like. And you can see what asymmetry looks like, changes in color, border. You know, border's completely absent right in here. It's got like a pinkish, black, red, probably some grays in there. There's a tricky one. That's what's called an amelanotic melanoma. Those are bad. Because in most cases, we don't think that's a melanoma. Um, I can't tell you, I don't think I have in the 17 years that I've been doing this, I don't think there's been one time that I've ever removed an amelanotic melanoma that I put melanoma in the differential. I've always put usually basal cell or squamous cell. Um, about 3% of me melanomas diagnosed are amelanotic, meaning that they have no pigment to it. And that's tricky because a lot of people have a, a tendency to neglect that because certainly if it looked like that, you're going to be more inclined to show up in the office faster than you might with something that looks like maybe a bug bite that's just festering up. And especially, you know, some men, hard-headed, have a tendency to overlook stuff like this and don't tell people about it. It looks like a sore, too, like it's not Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was unfortunately an individual who didn't make it real long. Another, that's called a lentigo maligna. It's a form of melanoma. Uh, easily treated, but it's just, you can kind of see it just looks weird. It doesn't look like your normal age spot necessarily. Because you can see is what his other age spots look like. Very faint, but the purple dots, I put those on there when I do biopsies. That's just so when we take photos and when we refer to the surgeon that they're, they know exactly where we were looking. Because sometimes if you don't put the actual where it is, the skin looks different when you see it. Melanoma on the ear. Uh, these are more lentigo malignants. These are early melanomas, so these patients do great. Melanoma on the cheek, lentigo maligna. That's seborrheic keratosis. Looks ugly, but it's just a, one of those barnacles that we get from age. Now this is where we're getting into, we're going to change up a little bit. So we're talking about more basal cell, squamous cell. So you can see this is kind of looks like a non-healing sort. Now you, you know, we showed you that amelanotic melanoma. We're showing you that, you look at that, you probably say, okay, amelanotic melanoma. So you can kind of see where the confusion would be. This does not look any different than that, does it? Right. No. Other than you can see some pigment around there, but you, there's pigment everywhere on the skin. So that's why you know you, I do biopsies I mean certainly all of these things I know because I've done the biopsy it's not 
like I, I see these and now the classic ones you, yeah you might say I, I knew beforehand but a lot of these it's just something doesn't look right I do a biopsy so retrospectively I know what the answer is so I have the advantage of I knew what it I know what it is now because I did the biopsy and that's the most important thing is just realizing something's not right and get it off the skin uh, so you're looking at a uh, basal cell carcinoma you know non-healing sore big squamous cell that's called a keratoacanthoma. It's a rapidly erupting squamous cell. Just been there for, really, that's only been there a couple months, but it just they grow real rapidly. But a lot of people start to think it's a bug bite. They'll start out looking like a bug bite, and it just, like that, takes, takes hold. Another one right there called a keratoacanthoma. So it's a subset of squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the nice thing about these kind of things is pretty much what you see is what you get. So it's not deep. It's, well, no, not really. That's all just skin cells, so you can't squeeze any. It looks like you could, yeah. yeah. So it's just like, it looks like there would be something Yeah, it's skin cells. It's, dead, it's abnormal skin cells that are just, they, like they're, yeah. they're immature, so they don't shed, and it builds this little keratinaceous core. Um, so you scoop under that thing, and you pretty much get the whole thing out of there. Yeah, people do well with those. Little subtle, uh, I threw that in there because it's pigmented. So you might think, oh, maybe that's like a melanoma or something like that. That's actually what's called a pigmented basal cell. Again, how do I know that? Because I did the biopsy. Oh, yeah. Right, and the pathologist told me it was a basal cell. I, 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 I saw that thing and probably put melanoma on the differential for that because it looks like a melanoma. It has pigment to it. But not all pigmented lesions necessarily are melanoma, so I try and reassure my patients of that. Uh, there, this is a, a, a kind of a deep basal cell that we're dealing with. So again, people will see stuff like this and they just kind of let it grow, let it fester. Another one of those keratoacanthomas. This is what we'll see a lot of pigmented lesion on the lip. Is it inside the lip? Um, yeah, it's just kind of just right inside that. This is benign. It was just kind of a, a freckle lentigo, um, but how do I know that? Right, the pathologist tells me what it is. Right, it comes off the lip. Because if you get a melanoma on the lip, the metastatic rate is, is through the roof. Yeah, you don't want a melanoma on the lip. That's a bad spot to get a melanoma. Because um, that gets into the lymphatics in the bloodstream real quick. Yeah. That was just a wart. But again, kind of scary looking, yeah. Yeah. So again, how do I know it's a wart? Because I did the biopsy. Right. Oh. This is a gentleman who uh, actually, this goes back probably in my, when I first transitioned out of the military and I started coming down here, uh, probably about 2003, 2004, um, this unfortunate gentleman was one who came into my office in, when we were over there, we're in the newer side of the building now, but over in the older side of the building, he showed up. Uh, no health care, probably at best maybe a sixth grade education, doesn't really know much uh, what to do, has no access to health care. I've been working in the fields his whole life, that's all he's known, you know, salt of the earth kind of guy. He's not trying to be negligent, just doesn't know what to do with it. Um, you know, doesn't have access to that health care system. And um, I, it was someone in a relation somehow, I don't remember exactly because we're talking, you know, 11, 12 years ago now. Um, I'm thinking it was like a, a cousin or something like that I just happened to see him and say what the heck brought him in and he unfortunately this was all squamous cell that was on that lip he actually ended up losing this whole lower area I mean it looked like just when they did the surgery uh, like one of those Halloween type just skull things almost like uh, if everyone saw the Batman movie with uh, Two-Face the most recent Batman I mean it was just all exposed down there um, he had no insurance, so, you know, uh, at our office they did it kind of as a charity case. Had to send him to the ENTs for wide. I mean, they basically had to flap skin from all the way up underneath his neck and bring that up. It was, it was unbelievable. Lost to follow-up, don't know where he is, haven't seen him since that point in time. So I'm not sure how he's doing at all. I don't have any follow-up on him. What do you think about that? What would you think about that at first, though? How about cold sore? Yeah, right? So this is a gentleman who I saw um, 
this is probably uh, maybe two or three years ago, came in for with a cold sore. Uh, that's, he came in, we put him on some Valtrex, it was a cold sore, he's always had a cold sore there. He comes back in eight weeks later, it's like, man, this cold sore will not go away. He's always had a cold sore in that same spot. So it wasn't anything unusual, but for some reason at this point in time, the skin decided it didn't want to heal right. And that happens. I get people all the time who have areas of injury where they'll get a bug bite, they'll get cut, they'll get uh, you know, a splinter, they'll get a cold sore. And from the years of abusing the skin, eventually your body doesn't heal properly after that and a skin cancer shows up. That's a lot of those little raised up bumps. I bet you those were probably a bug bite or some area of injury and then the body just, because the DNA is so atypical from all the sun exposure, that it just heals improperly, and that's what happened to this guy. So he ended up actually needing a lip resection here. But uh, again, long-standing thing. So you know that's the, kind of the hallmark of a skin cancer is a non-healing sore. Uh, anything that's been around longer than about four to six weeks needs to be evaluated. Uh, even if it's like this guy, fortunately he paid attention to it. He's like, you know, this is the longest cold sore I've ever had. Um, what's wrong? We did a biopsy because of that reason, and like I said, it was it was a squamous cell carcinoma. Now, was it a squamous cell one he had seen me a few weeks or a couple months before that? I don't think so. I think it was, it actually was a cold sore, but it just, when the body tried to heal, it healed abnormally. So, again, hallmark non-healing sores. So, moles that are changing size, shape, color, and sores that don't heal. You can see big squamous cell on the cheek there. Squamous cell on the nose there. This one looks a little different. What do you notice about this? It's like it's the, indentation. the indentation, right? So you say to the patient, how long has that been there? Oh, that's just been developing over the last few years. You notice he's got a lot of erythema around there too. So what he had was what's called a sclerosing basal cell. So what's happening underneath the skin is that basal cell was deep under the skin and it was just basically like a black hole and almost like black sucking the skin the into it. Yeah. 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 So you gotta pay attention to stuff like that too. This I throw in here because I think it's cute. You see what his <laughs> see what his tattoo says? And then you can see with the purple dots that I put on there. So this isn't anything profound other than the fact I told him it was predestination. <laughs> you got a cancer tattoo, so it made it real easy for us to find where your cancer was going to be. So, some more squamous cells, as you can see. So, some of these are a little easier. I mean, you can certainly pick that out and say that's not right. Okay. But you would be surprised at what some of these patients will just walk around with. Because these are virtually painless. Not very often does this cause any pain. Oh. Now this is a sad story, and this is good. I think this is brings us to the end, yeah. Um, this is a gentleman that, 62 years old, comes in with this on his ear. Plumber. His daughter-in-law has brought him in, and I know you guys have plenty of stories like this for other cases of cancer. He has been covering this thing up with a Band-Aid for the better part of probably about three or four years, telling his family that he's been bitten by a bug. He tells them, oh yeah, he keeps coming up with a story, I was under the house doing this, and a bug bit me, and they, he just keeps telling the same story. Get bitten by a bug, it won't heal. Bug bite, it won't heal. Bug bite, it won't heal. So he's at the beach, Band-Aid comes off at the beach, and I'm sure you can figure his family kinda <laughs> nuts up. Yeah. Like, what is on here? That is not a bug bite. So anyway, so promptly, um, the young lady who was his daughter-in-law was a long-standing patient of mine. She called me, said, listen, I, my father-in-law needs to come in. I said, we'll bring him on in. We saw him that morning. Uh, take a look at that. And I was like, ooh, that's not good. Uh, you can't really appreciate it, but right in here is a hard mass mm -hmm. in his neck. Oh. Never a good sign. Mm -hmm. Never a good sign. So certainly we do the biopsies. Comes back as a squamous cell carcinoma. He has nodal disease littered throughout his abdomen, doesn't live to see his 63rd birthday. Now, you know, why do I bring that up? Not because I want to depress anybody in here, but this is a case where this is a gentleman who, because of just whether it was ignorance or denial, didn't 
live a full life because of something that could have been easily present, pre prevented. And this is what I try and get through to patients is, you know, I, I understand if, if you get, you know, an internal cancer, cervical, uterine, lung, liver, you know, unfortunately in some of those cases, it, it by the time the diagnosis is made, it's too late because you, you're waiting for symptoms. But it's unfortunate when you hear a case like this, because that was there. Mm -hmm. He was hiding it. I mean, he knew it was there. It was there for us to make a diagnosis. And all those other photos that I showed you, those people, except for the melanotic melanoma, that guy didn't do well either. But that was because that's a melanoma. But all those others, those cancers that we showed in those pictures, no matter how nasty they were, didn't kill them because they came in on a timely basis and said, listen, something isn't right. And that's kind of what this whole lecture for me is, to certainly give you the education, but really bring it home. If you've got something that you think is unusual on the skin, do not neglect it because skin cancer, I'm, I'm glad we don't get the respect that some of the other cancers do because it's typically easy to treat it because it is easy to treat. And it's, it's a shame when I have to share a story like this for this guy who doesn't get to see his grandchildren grow up, great-grandchildren grow up for something that was easy to prevent. I mean, this is his responsibility. You know, he's at fault for that, unfortunately. That was neglect. And that's... I'm sure didn't have health insurance. That was another issue. He was scared of the money aspect of it too. Doesn't feel like he's got the money to take care of it. And I do respect some of those things, but um, so if you come across anything like that with any of the patients, come in, please send them over directly. And that's all I have.